welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks, and welcome to episode 52 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Before we jump into this week's episode with Elena Padakova, I've got a, a great email that I received that I just wanted to share with you, and it really, it really was one of the best emails I've ever received in regard to the podcast, and it was from a listener called uh, David Smythe, and his email says, Hi David, just a quick email to say thanks. My eldest son, Nate, who is now 14 years of age, was born with a variety of serious congenital heart defects. Over the years, he's undergone eight open heart operations and numerous supporting operations. He has a pacemaker, mechanical valve, and his heart has been extensively replumbed. We spent many months in various Brisbane hospitals over the years. We live in Cairns, so it's been challenging managing this. Nate is not naturally drawn to outdoor activities like sport and tends to spend most of his time indoors. So I was keen to find something he could do outdoors that was not too physically demanding and provided the benefits of getting outdoors. After listening to some of your podcasts, it occurred to me that sailing would be ideal. In one of your podcasts, you encourage listeners to visit their local yacht club to get involved. So I contacted our local sailing club, booked myself, Nate and his younger brother Elliot into a beginner's sailing course. Over several weeks, we learned the basics of sailing using puffin paces dinghies, including learning the hard way to remember to duck under the boom. This went well, and I thought we shouldn't waste these newly acquired skills. Nate was not keen on the stress of racing, so I thought we could simply go sailing on weekends for a bit of fun and get outdoors. So I bought a small old fixed keel sailing boat, a 25-foot top hat, for $6,250. Basically the price of a crappy second-hand car. It is in pretty good condition given its age and came with everything including a relatively new tender and a permanent swing mooring in the cans inlet. The swing mooring only costs about $55 a year. It's not flash or fast, but it's clean, sails and floats. I was pleasantly surprised how low the cost can be to actually get started on the water. This little boat, which we have had for just over a year now, has been fantastic. We go to local islands or nearby beaches and have had multiple overnight trips. It's small enough for the boys to handle the sails, etc. And we regularly take other kids out sailing with us too. These kids are often experiencing sailing for the first time and like Nate, going through various challenges. We have learned the steps in this little boat and hope to learn a lot more. Your podcasts have really helped so I just wanted to let you know the impact they've had on us and hope this encourages you to continue sharing information about sailing. All the best, and I look forward to hearing more great stories. Regards, David Smythe. So, folks, I just wanted to share that email with you because, um, you know, it's it's just a great story, uh, and it's a great example of how accessible sailing can be. And, and, you know, as always, if you want to get started with sailing, you haven't sailed before, you know, turn up at your local yacht club, and I'll point you in the right direction. You and you, you might be surprised how accessible sailing is for you and how little the cost is. So, a big thank you to David Smythe for sharing that uh, email, that really touching story with me, and and well done, Nate, on getting out on the water and giving it a go, and your brother Elliot for uh, getting into sailing and uh, discovering something outdoors you can do that really. Um, can uh, make your life uh, so much more enjoyable and fulfilling. So uh, David sent me three photos. I'm going to link to those off uh, the uh, podcast episode at oceansailingpodcast.com forward slash podcast. Um, I'll I'll link to the photos off the um, episode in there so you can check those out and I encourage you to. Now before we jump into this week's uh, episode of the podcast, I've had some uh, great feedback over the last couple of weeks since uh, releasing a number of upcoming ocean racing, ocean regatta uh, and ocean passage trips and the opportunity to join us uh, for a paid adventure on board uh, my yacht Ocean Gem. So I've recently added some more uh, events to the calendar or if you just go to the homepage of the OceanSailingPodcast.com website, you'll find links to the calendar uh, and those events include the Queensland Beneteau Cup later this year uh, followed by a 400 nautical mile offshore passage from Southport on the Gold Coast to Pittwater just north of Sydney Uh, and next year one of the things I really want to do that I've never done before is uh, sail 300 miles out into the Tasman Sea and uh, sail around the Middleton Reef. The Middleton Reef is a notorious reef that uh, rises uh, 3,000 meters from the Tasman Sea floor 
up to the point where at low tide the reef's actually visible uh, above the ocean surface. It's claimed more than 70 vessels in the last 100 years and some of those wrecks are still visible on the reef. The reef's about seven miles long uh, and it's quite a sight to see and, and it's literally in a in a bees line between the top of New Zealand and uh, Brisbane, Australia. So we're going to sail out to Middleton Reef, uh, down to the Elizabeth Reef, which is about uh, 30 nautical miles south. Another reef that is visible at low tide and uh, as recently as three or four years ago claimed a Hansi 40 footer that hit it and ran aground. And then we're going to head 100 nautical miles further south to Lord Howe Island, which again is quite a unique island off the east coast of Australia. So uh, check that out. Uh, it's a pretty cool six day experience. Uh, so check that out at oceansailingpodcast.com. So on to this week's episode. This week I'm catching up with uh, Lena Patakova. Uh, Lena I met f- last year. She s- flew from Sweden to Sydney and did, a, did the Sydney to Hobart race with us. And uh, she has got a great story and, and an amazing background in mountaineering, Arctic sailing and all sorts of adventure leading voyages and expeditions. So I had a cro- great chat with Lena. She was in Gothenburg to see the uh, finish of the uh, penultimate leg of the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh, she was down in the village. And Lena talks about leadership styles and the importance of those when it comes to managing and leading crews uh, and the impact on uh, teams where you're taking those people to difficult and dangerous places where the elements are another whole level from what we're used to uh, where we sail in warmer latitudes and uh, share some great insights and stories to share. I'm going to link to Lena's adventure website from the podcast episode uh, so oceansailingpodcast.com forward slash podcast. If you go there, find the episode 52. I'm going to link to Lena's uh, adventure website. So she's got some amazing stories and some amazing ad- photos from all of her adventures over the last few years, both on the water and on the land. So I recommend if you really want some inspiration, and you want to see, see some really cool stuff, go check out Lena's website and uh, I think you'll be uh, inspired by what you see and some of the stories she has to share there. So enjoy this episode with Lena Patakova. Hey Lena, how are you doing? Yeah, it, it's good to hear from you, Dave, David. And it actually seems like uh, Sydney to Hobart was yesterday or uh, a few weeks ago. I was uh, at the Volvo Ocean Race Village um, today and uh, I just got those throwbacks to Sydney to Hobart. It was uh-huh. nice. So, you're, so just for the benefit of our listeners, you're in Gothenburg in Sweden right now. Yes, I live nearby Gothenburg. I live in the west coast of Sweden. And uh, yesterday I went to Volvo Ocean Race uh, Village to visit uh, the teams and to, um, to look at the boats and look, uh, join the festivities, mm-hmm. so to say. Uh, the boats arrived um, very late at night between the uh, 14th and the 15th. And uh, the crew were resting mostly. Uh, it was a very close competition between um, uh, Mapfrey and uh, Team Brunel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at the end, there was less than a mile between them, actually like 0.4, 0.2 between them. Wow. But Team Brunel took the first um, uh, the first place in this leg. Really close, and I read this morning that... Um... Team Brunel, of course, has got Peter Burling, the Kiwi America's Cup skipper on the boat, and Matt Frey's got Blair Took, who was a, was a trimmer and grinder on the America's Cup boat, and then there's Dong Feng as well, and all three of them are on equal points with a bonus point that Dong Feng has as a result of their their margin of the fleet. So so from what I understand, you've got three a three-way tie going into the final race, which is basically a sprint, I think, the, the last... Correct. Uh, the, the last leg of the Volvo Ocean race is, you know, less than two days sailing. So it's pretty amazing to have three boats tied for the lead. Yeah, yeah, correct. What's the village like in terms of the, the atmosphere and the people there and, and uh, all the festivities? Oh, it's, um, it's very nice. It's uh, a very large event. So um, it's, uh, it covers a huge area and it's you know, very professional and well-made. 
and um, very nice to actually have the chance to meet the teams. Uh, it was not possible to visit the uh, actual boat, but there is a uh, similar boat um, to visit in, um, in, a, in a special um, exhibition hall. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> uh, for me, it was very nice to be able to actually interact with the crew, interact with the team. And uh, although there are a, a few of them were quite tired uh, since yesterday, um, yeah, it was great. That's... And uh, there was a there was a little bit of harbor sailing, like um, uh, and uh, a few of legendary uh, boats from the race were also there. So. Um, for those who wanted to, to come by and say hello, it was quite possible. Mm -hmm. Also, a Viking ship was there um, in the harbor. And I've, I've talked to the organization that um, works with it. It's a replica from, uh, from an original Viking ship. And they actually do sailing in the west coast of Sweden. So uh, I'm looking forward to join them. Wow, so you're going to go for sail with them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's pretty cool. It'll be a fun experience. Uh huh. Yeah, I've been watching the the Vikings series on Netflix, and it's, it's just absolutely stunning to see the 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 backdrop of the landscape in that area, but also the the way they lived and the way they travelled. Is they're incredible, incredible, um, incredible people to travel by sea like they did in the conditions they did, uh, especially in the cold months of the year. Yeah, and especially at the time where um, there was no. Um, None of the um, nautical aids that we have today. It's incredible. Mm. Yeah, and also just how cold and wet they must have got at times without all the modern, all, all the all of the modern the clothing we have to keep us warm and dry. Yeah, uh, but actually, when you think uh, to what uh, the people in the sports are using today, I've been sailing the Arctic quite a quite a bit. I think I have two and a half thousand nautical miles logged in the Arctic mm -hmm. to Greenland and uh, Svalbard, Spitsbergen and so on. And um, since, well, a few, uh, maybe 10 or 20 years, um, most of the sailors in the Arctic are uh, using wool uh, as their um, middle layers or um, uh, under on the lev uh, levels, uh, layers. Mm -hmm. And that's that's exactly what people back then have been using all the time. Um, also, for example, if you look at the um, historical um, expeditions to, uh, um, for example, to the uh, South Pole, uh, why did the Amundsen why, why did the Amundsen crew succeed that well in both sailing there and reaching the South Pole? Yeah, they looked at uh, what the indigenous people actually use, and they copied their um, original clothes. So uh, a lot of wool and uh, fur clothes that repel water. And this is um, one of the reasons they actually uh, made it. Well, and Because it's, the, yeah, the same, the same things work uh, now uh, and back then. Yeah, absolutely. Well, wool's an amazing product, particularly if you have multiple layers. It's amazing how, how warm it keeps you. Yeah, even when it's wet, uh, you can keep warm. Yeah, absolutely. So so tell me about what you've been up to since we, we last uh, we, we were last together in uh, Tasmania. I, I, I know from following your um, Adrena Lena website that when you got back to Sweden from doing the Sydney Hobart race with us, you had... You were a little bit of a local kind of uh, celebrity, shall we say, in terms of uh, newspaper newspaper articles and radio interviews, and it was it's, it was quite a big deal in the in the in the town that you lived in. Yeah, absolutely. And um, after after doing those interviews, uh, and I also did some interviews for an online uh, paper for um, uh, for sailing. Mm -hmm. uh, after doing that, I've, um, I've visited, um, I flew back to, uh, uh, I flew back east, uh, but to Philippines this time, and I've done some sailing there. Um, and a lot of time was spent um, in administration and planning for the coming year's adventures. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I will be doing some mountaineering, I will be going back to Mont Blanc uh, to bring a group uh, on uh, top mm -hmm. um, 
to get them to attempt the summit as a little warm-up and training for Kilimanjaro. We'll be doing that too. And uh, we'll be doing both Scandinavian style. So we'll bring all of our stuff, all of our tents, food, water, and so on. And we'll be carrying them uh, ourselves. So mm-hmm. no, no bearers, no uh, porters and stuff. Uh, and also I've been preparing for the um, sailing season uh, in Sweden. Mm-hmm. We've we'll had a very late winter uh, this year. So in April, uh, it has been snowing and uh, been freezing cold. Uh, so there was no uh, sailing uh, for, for me until uh, basically now, May, June. Wow. Uh, so uh, I actually had uh, a sailing trip planned for the summer <clears throat> where I would go from Norway to Iceland to South Greenland and then further on to Newfoundland, Labrador. Yeah. So uh, it was to be a, an Arctic trip in the wake of the Vikings um, where we would follow the same route, basically. It was a delivery trip. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, I have actually cancelled it and I will not be uh, going um, it, it would have been interesting for me to uh, to sail I love the Arctic and I love to um, to sail those waters with all the multiple uh, challenges that uh, they, they can present but um, I've actually already sailed between Iceland and Greenland and I've sailed a lot of Norway uh, so that part of the trip was less interesting for me, but I was really looking forward to um, Greenland to um, Labrador. Mm-hmm. However, I, I actually changed my mind, and um, for once I will be uh, staying at home or doing some other adventures and not be sailing the Arctic in this British summer. And so tell me about what, because we talked a little bit about the trip that you had planned when we were in Tasmania, and it sounded really exciting. So tell me about what led to you changing your mind, because um, I'm keen to find out more. It was not an easy decision, uh, and it required a few weeks of uh, thinking and um, looking at pros and cons. But basically, um, it was a boat delivery uh, that I was uh, supposed to be doing for a skipper from Canada, uh, together with a mixed crew mm-hmm. and uh, all in all it sounded very nice and uh, as I said I, I was actually only keen uh, on joining from Greenland to Labrador but the skipper asked me to join all the way from uh, Iceland or all the way from Norway even uh, because I was to be the um, uh, most experienced person on board and uh, well thanks to my uh, previous Arctic sail- sailing. And um, there was some kind of a, um insurance thing that they wanted to have uh, somebody to um, to be able to be on board all the time with all that experience. Yeah. experience. So I, I agreed to that a bit reluctantly, but um, yeah, I, I agreed to being away a month or so uh, to see. But it uh, started... Uh, eventually it turned out that uh, the skipper was not that experienced himself and the boat that he had purchased in Denmark uh, to deliver to uh, to the Great Lakes where he lived um, was not uh, really uh, seaworthy when it comes to the Arctic. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have, if I would have uh, made a pick myself, I would have chosen a um, steel boat, like a steel catch with um, a, um, uh, that, that, that would have, have been geared to um, withstand all the challenges uh, of the Arctic, the, uh, the cold, the uh, um, ever-present ice and so on. But with a plastic boat, you have to be very sure that you're only cruising the waters that are uh, ice free mm-hmm. uh, because as soon as you uh, catch drifting ice even uh, blocks of ice that are as large as an A4 piece of paper uh, can damage your hull right. and, and that counts also for steel boats it can damage the gear or, or get some cracks going on so 
uh, we had to be very sure that the uh, um, the road that we were going to take would be completely ice free. Uh, but that's not really an issue um, if you have enough time and if you have a crew that is um, committed to be um, to be there all the way. Yeah. But uh, it turned out that uh, the time frame was already set and people had uh, bought tickets uh, to get there and back and so on. So um, as we were continue, continuing to plan this trip, I found myself uh, getting more and more responsibility for uh, having this um uh, for, for, for planning this trip and uh, making sure that this would be um, a success. Uh, but I never got the possibility to um, to have the uh, uh, to decide the time time frame, the gear, the crew. So I had a lot of responsibilities in that in that matter, but I did not have any freedom to to actually choose and uh, form the trip how I wanted it to be. I would, I would have liked uh, to add a lot of extra gear for the uh, Arctic and a lot of redundancy for the uh, uh, already existing systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have liked to add a lot of more experienced crew, uh, which is not that simple to, um, to get with that, with that kind of notice. Uh, if the skipper is not willing to pay. And also I would have liked to add a couple of weeks extra for the weather and uh, all the margins, especially for the ice, uh, because if the ice conditions change, even if the weather is okay, then we will not be able to sail. Mm -hmm. um, and I also would have liked to see that there was another uh, experienced person uh, on board that could have, that could read the ice maps that have done navigation in the Arctic previously. Um, so with all of that on the table, I've uh, realized that <clears throat> this is going to be a quite of a challenge and uh, I cannot guarantee that this will, um, that, uh, this will go smoothly. Yeah. And, uh, when you play around in the Arctic, when you sail around there, um, there's even more uh, danger for uh, both health, health and lives if something goes uh, not smoothly. Uh, if you get into a gale or a storm in the tropics, uh, there is a chance that uh, the crew in the boat can make it. But when you do it in the Arctic, there are so many, uh, there's so much harsher conditions and there's so much more wind chill. Uh, there may be ice getting in the way um, or breaking uh, structurally um, damaging the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, if any of the crew um, gets into the water, uh, there is basically not so much to do about that because um, people get hypothermia in just a couple of minutes. Right. And uh, there are very remote areas, so you cannot count on any help at all, especially not within minutes. Um, so if there is a, any structural damage to the boat uh, and you have to abandon bo boat, then the chances of survival are quite small. So uh, in those situations, you really have to uh, analyze the risks and um, see what uh, uh, what chances there are. Of course, there is a very big chance that we could have managed to do the trip in beautiful weather without any um, problems at all, without any challenges. Uh, that would require one month or three weeks, almost non-stop sailing. Um, but uh, I do know the area. I know that the weather is very unpredictable. Um, there are constant laws, uh, uh, low pressure areas uh, brewing over Iceland. And I also know that the global warming is causing the glaciers in uh, Greenland to melt at a faster rate, which of course means a lot more drifting ice in the water, uh, both icebergs and uh, growlers and small pieces of ice. Mm -hmm. So we cannot just get out and hope hope for the best, as the Vikings did, and um, 
and continue navigating to our uh, final port of call, uh, I choose to do a, um, a risk assessment and it was not looking good. And, and then I realized I'm not even getting paid for this. Uh, so, so I would be, I would be away for one month risking my life, uh, freezing and, uh, living in very uncomfortable conditions, being away from my family and mm -hmm. for what yeah. uh, I, I really was interested in half of that trip anyway. So I realized that, uh, boats come and go and opportunities come and go. I also have my own boat. Uh, I may uh, upgrade it in the future for um, Arctic sailing. I do not know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I decided not to throw myself at that opportunity and for once uh, take a wise and, uh, <laughs> and smart decision to actually stay at home. So I was uh, sailing the west coast of Sweden, close to my family and... Um, hopefully a little bit warmer mm -hmm. and hoping for uh, some other adventures or some uh, some other expedition to join if there's anything in the uh, okay. uh, short notice. Okay. Well, I think, um, I mean, it's really interesting having this conversation with you, Lena, because it sounds like this could be the best trip that you, you never did. Um, and it's easy to be optimistic and go to sea and think, you know, it'll be okay. But... You know, I guess a question for you: If you if you hadn't already done two and a half thousand nautical miles of Arctic sailing previously, and you didn't have the experience you had, do you think that you may have, you know, gone along boldly and thought it will be okay? But it's that experience that's given you that wisdom and that judgment now that actually just helped to help you, help you to make a much better decision about not not proceeding when you started to get instincts that you that were telling you otherwise. Yeah, definitely. I, I think experience. Uh, the key words there and if I would not have known what Arctic sailing is I would have just uh, come along and thought well you know how, how bad can it be yeah. uh, but after uh, sailing the Arctic I know exactly how bad and how uncomfortable and how dangerous it can be and it's very easy to forget <clears throat> it's you know the survival bias uh, when everything goes smoothly, you just expect everything to go smoothly next time and mm -hmm. the time after. And uh, if you forget to do risk assessment every time, then um, you may end up in very uh, uncomfortable conditions and uh, jeopardize uh, health or life. <clears throat> I've been in, uh, for example, in Arctic uh, sailing where... <clears throat> I mean, the weather was not that bad. It was a, a medium to strong breeze, and the sea was a little bit uncomfortable, only in the terms that uh, it was coming uh, from the side of the boat as we're having, uh, heading east from uh -huh. Greenland to Iceland. But even those slight conditions uh, developed into crew being unable to do uh, basically anything. We had some amateurs on board, amateur sailors, and um, most of the crew, except for me and the skipper of the boat, were um, just not being able to do uh, anything. There was one person just uh, lying in the bunk and uh, being seasick, and another just sitting still and... Um, uh, unable to to basically talk or or do anything on board, and the third one was a um, firefighter from uh, I think I think he was in his forties, a huge guy, very tough, very strong, and he sort of held on uh, during the first day, and during this he was feeling seasick, and mm -hmm. during the second or the third he just tumbled down and uh, went down below and talked to me and said that, hey, you know, I'm sorry, but I cannot take this anymore. It ends here. This is it. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, <clears throat> you'll have to talk to the skip about that. <laughs> and the skipper was sleeping at the at that time. The skipper, uh, he, was, uh, he was 70 um, a very experienced Arctic sailor. So, so the guy goes uh, 
to to his bunk and says, you know, I'm sorry, I cannot take this anymore. You know, <laughs> it has to end. So, uh, and the skipper opens one eye and look at him, looks at him and says, well, you know, there ain't no bus stops in the middle of Denmark Strait. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we we had to tell the guy to just go and lay lay down in his bunk, and uh, he was relieved of all the. Uh, work on the boat and all the watches and uh, so was everyone I mean the skip had to uh, shorthand all the way to Iceland uh, and this is the kind of thing that happens uh, and I know that uh, you know next time it could be only me who is capable of sailing because yeah. of the tough weather or any conditions or maybe somebody gets sick uh, especially with people who are less experienced that are on board or even worse, I maybe am the one who is incapacitated and cannot do anything. Mm-hmm. And if anything happens to the boat, and I uh, and I happen to be the, the most experienced person on board, then it's my responsibility to uh, to do something about the situation. And uh, with uh, that kind of a, um, with those conditions. Uh, you never know what what it does to people. So uh, normally, I'm quite sure that I will not be the one that is affected by uh, any sea sickness. But you never know; there may be anything else. Uh, people get knocked over by uh, by the boom, or people get sick on board, or you know, anything can happen. So there should be redundancy for everything. There should be enough experience on board. There should be enough. Uh, people that know what they're actually doing, what they can expect when the sun stops shining and the sea gets a little bit rougher and uh, people lose their uh, ability to you know, to sail or comprehend or take decisions. Mm. Um, there should be people on board that know what it is about. And the only way to know it is to actually um, expose yourself to those situations and uh, undergo... Um, tougher and tougher adventures so you can see a little bit for yourself what yeah. what can actually happen mm-hmm. it's quite amazing how uh, you, you get a combination of physical conditions particularly with rough weather and cold weather and extreme wind chill and then and then fear or anxiety creeps in the mental deterioration of somebody can reduce them to can be completely in, incapacitated in, in a matter of a few hours. Um, it's easy to underestimate the impact, particularly for people that aren't that experienced in those types of conditions. Yeah. And fear is an interesting factor here because uh, fear is normal for human beings. Fear is a normal reaction um, to a dangerous situation, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so people do who do not feel fear either do not understand the um, the gravity of the situation or uh, maybe have some some kind of a um, condition where they where they do not feel fear it's it's not normal fear is normal but uh, it's important never to base your decisions on fear and letting um, not letting fear affect your decision uh, is actually what we call bravery, right? Yeah. So, so you acknowledge that fear, uh, but you do not panic and you do not let it affect you. That's and this right. is what um, this is what something uh, this is something that is um, dependent on how much trust you have for the boat, for the skipper, and for the crew. And I guess it's, uh, this is what I lacked in terms of this um, planned trip for the summer. Mm. I did not uh, have the trust in the crew that was called together because I did not know uh, whether they were uh, experienced enough for the, for the Arctic. I did not have trust in the skipper because uh, I knew that uh, he was not experienced uh, enough the Arctic. And uh, the questions that he asked and the uh, planning that I asked me to do uh, all pointed in the direction that he does not have the resources and the experience that uh, are required. And finally, I was not 
uh, I did not have trust in the boat because it was a, a cruising boat, um, perfect for uh, luxurious cruising in, in the lakes or, or on the uh, west coast of Sweden during good weather, but it was not formed uh, or geared to be a, um, an offshore boat, the uh, subarctic and arctic conditions. Mm. So what I usually say to, to people that uh, say, sail with me, if, especially if there is a risk for um, some harsh conditions, I ask them before they even set the foot on the boat, I ask them, do they trust me as the skipper? And do they trust the boat? And do they trust the crew? And if the answer is yes to all of those questions, then they're welcome to, to, sail, uh, to sail along. Because if the answer is no, and they're still sailing, whenever the person gets tired uh, or you know um, scared or something happens or the wind picks up, we have to reef the sails and the skies are looking dark and maybe it's uh, maybe we're, we're going to do some night sailing and they're not used to that. Uh, the normal reaction um, when people get a little bit afraid is to question. Will the boat hold? Mm. Is this okay? Or are we going to sink? Yeah. Or or does the skipper is the skipper taking the right decision? Because I've heard that you have to do this and that. Or is the crew going to you know? And as soon as they start doubting this, uh, people get into panic, and there is so much uh, ir- irrational fear that can um, arise from this. Uh, but this is uh, when the, the going gets tough. It's not the right moment to ask yourself whether I trust the boat, or trust the skipper, or trust the crew. You have to ask yourself that before you set your foot on the boat. Mm. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really, really interesting point. You, you can you ask some questions about the boat. Yeah, yeah. You you can you can ask yourself uh, you can ask the skipper about the experience that she or he has, and you can ask about the boat. You can bring your own gear. You can uh, double check systems. You can you know you can do all that kind of prepare all that kind of preparation beforehand. And if you do not trust the crew, then you can do interviews with them. You can do a lot of training before you do some serious sailing. You know all of that uh, can be addressed before you go. Mm. onto that adventure sailing but uh that question should not be asked when you're out there because then it's just a source of irrational fears and panic yeah and in some of the situations you've been in with your with your general you know your adventure sailing but your your adventuring generally in terms of mountaineering as well yeah i guess establishing those yeah. things is pretty critical because once you're once you're halfway to somewhere or you're halfway to nowhere in the middle of nowhere you can't just turn back, but also equally, when I mean, you're counting on these people, so when they once they become incapacitated, they they stop contributing, but they actually turn into a liability that you've then got to manage. So your workload kind of increases because you're managing somebody who's down, and you're trying to you know make make up for what they can't contribute with what you're physically having to do yourself. So it's a it's a really interesting one, particularly when people go to more extreme locations or more extreme parts of the world um, from an adventure point of view. Correct. Uh, actually, people are uh, very much affected by uh, altitude sickness syndromes uh, on the higher mountains. So after about 400, oh, 4,000 meters, um, which, are, which is the height that you will be um, passing on the way up to uh, Mont, Mont Blanc or Elbrus or Kilimanjaro, after th- three, already three to 4,000 meters, you will have those uh, altitude uh, uh, symptoms mm-hmm. and that makes people uh, it can turn a group of uh, physically fit uh, mature people into a group of five year olds who are absolutely uh, out of control and they cannot take care of themselves they question um, everything and they just want to turn back because oh I'm not feeling good uh, they will not be drinking water, they will not be eating food because they feel that, oh, I don't feel for it, so, so I will not be doing that. Uh, and if, well, also in those situations, it's very 
um, important that they have the trust in the guide. So this is something that I, uh, I talked to them before even attempting uh, to, uh, to climb the mountain uh, or to go up trekking. That uh, whenever I, as a guide, tell them to do something, then they, are, then they have to be doing this. Uh, no matter if it's about uh, drinking water, uh, taking care of themselves, stopping, going or anything, they should have the complete trust into me. And it's a structure that is quite uh, similar to whatever is happening on board. You have uh, the skipper who is um, responsible, who has the utter responsibility for uh, the boat and the lives of the people. And uh, no matter how um, what your leadership style is, uh, in, at the end, you expect the crew to be doing what, uh, uh, what you tell them to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really important that they, ha- they have the trust uh, and the uh, willingness to uh, to follow uh, whatever you're suggesting. Yeah, that's so true, particularly if you have a, situa- a situation that requires urgency in terms of action. Um, that's not the time to start a debate or have a mutiny, that's for sure. Absolutely. I've uh, sailed once with a... Um, uh, with a person, with a guy who was, uh, I think he was getting closer to his 50s, uh, who was keen on learning how to be a skipper. Mm-hmm. So he, and then I said, well, okay, you can you can skip the ship and uh, we can turn, uh, we can change places. Uh, so this is the only way to learn. Uh, and um, he was from Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, we are quite, used to very flat hierarchical structures so at workplaces you wouldn't have a boss that tells you what to do you would have a boss that is more like a personal coach Mm -hmm. a a moderator Mm -hmm. and people have a lot of responsibility they have freedom so they decide themselves what to do and Swedes are quite good at it um they they don't need to be micromanaged mm-hmm. a lot of meetings in the swedish way of uh, collaborating so you have you have those like daily meetings and weekly meetings where everyone discusses everything and you know uh, so that guy who tried to be a skipper uh, tried um uh, taking care of the boat he was very used to that kind of work Mm-hmm. And he had rights off and uh, given orders to, to anyone. So every time we would, we would be doing some long um, stealing legs, uh, but every time we would be uh, coming into harbor or changing, uh, having to change sails, he would just uh, need to stop and have a meeting with everyone <laughs> so that everyone would have consent on where we would drop the anchor and how and so on and um, it's not really a, um, a trait that is desirable from a, uh, a skipper in those uh, conditions no. uh, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a balance you do not want to have a, uh, a person that micromanages everything and screams at the crew and tells them what to do and this is what I really enjoyed when actually sailing on uh, Ocean Gem, uh, having a skipper that is a decent human being that listens to what the crew says, uh, that um, enjoys uh, taking decisions together with the crew and uh, is a little bit of a moderator and a little bit of uh, um, a coach for everyone. Mm. Uh, and this is just awesome. Um, is uh, looking at um, in the, the way that you have managed boats, David, it was just great. Thank and you. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a way of sailing and working that I enjoy a lot. I've been on several boats where the skipper assumes that the, uh, the role of the skipper is to boss people around mm. and to scream the hardest and <laughs> to tell people what to do and what not to do. And this is the kind of a um, skipper that ends up single handling 
yes. uh, the end because nobody would want to, to fail with that. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, with that example of a Swedish guy trying to, uh, to have meetings about where to drop anchor, this is not really uh, good either. Because as a leader of an expedition or as a skipper of a boat or as a manager of a team, you should be able to take um, fast decisions based on uh, all information that is at hand right now and make those decisions good. Yeah. Otherwise, you it won't come long. Yeah, well, that's right. Because I think there's, there's, there's sort of, I think there's probably three levels that I think that, you know, decision making um, and consultation. I mean, there's, there's, hey, we've got plenty of time and we don't know what the solution is here. So, asking your team what they think the options are and working that out. Um, and, yeah, and, and to that, have a discussion. Okay. Yeah, and then in the next the next stage is, hey, you know, here's what I'm thinking of doing and here's the reasons why um, from from a learning and teaching point of view, um, which gives people the, the ability to be, to have input, and, but also understand the reasons why. I think that's the next level. And then, and then there's times when you've just got to act and decide and be decisive because that's what's required because of urgency or time or safety or for whatever reason. Um, and so you can't, you can't always live in that kind of, you know, order barking mode, but you also can't live in the consult everybody all the time forever because yeah. otherwise, yeah. otherwise, you know, decisions don't get made and people don't necessarily learn in that environment either. Um, you've got, you know, exactly. To, but, and to get that balance going, you have to, you have to, uh, uh, have the trust of the crew, which you do not get by constantly giving them orders. No. Uh, so, so in, in order to to know that everyone is going to follow you, if, if you just tell them, you know, uh, the order, order from the skipper is everyone jumps into the water. Yeah. And then everyone does it without uh, without even asking, without even you know wondering to get <laughs> to get your crew to that level. You yeah. have to do uh, a lot of uh, leading on the first and second levels, as you as you uh, described. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and that's right. You can't just you just can't just back, discussing back all of the time. And um, you know, I, I always think that the people we are sailing with are volunteers, um, and and they've got something they yeah. want out of that, and they're they're contributing time and money to be there and at the expense of their family so it has to be a really enjoyable experience as well um and even if they were paid paid employees i think it's just as important i mean you're in a very small space working together you're you need cooperation and support and teamwork and you can have a lot of fun on a boat but i tell you what it can be a, a miserable place if you've got people that aren't, aren't getting on well with each other and are, are unhappy uh, that's for sure yeah yeah so i just wanted to i mean i just wanted to ask you there i mean you've done some You've done some amazing adventures, and you know, on land and on water. What I mean, what are what are some of your adventures? What have some of your favourite adventures been? Wow, um, I guess I'll have to say that sailing is um, definitely uh, uh, the best adventure. And um, I've, uh, for several years ago, I've um, quit my. Um, job that I had back then and I sold everything and uh, went off to sea in a circumnavigation attempt and I think that was the one uh, adventure that was the uh, the most powerful and um, most exciting because I've I've gone quite a long way I um, I've sailed all the way from Sweden to um, uh, just outside of Australia, mm -hmm. and uh, experienced so much. And it was a very, it was hard work, of course, but absolutely worth it for everything that I've learned, um, both about uh, myself and other people. And I've learned a, a quite a lot of new skills, um, and also all the places I've seen, all the wildlife and everything was just just amazing so um if uh, i would definitely uh, um if i get to choose i would have done it again and uh, i would recommend to everyone you mm -hmm. know to do something like that i was away for two years just living on the boat in different um, destinations in different countries and continents uh, so that, that was i think that was the best adventure uh -huh. and i mean what's What's what lies ahead for you over the next two years in terms of your your balance between um, you know your partner 
family, um, uh, adventuring your your corporate adventuring business that you have. Like, what's what does the next two years look like for you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. I uh, I'm going to continue with the uh, adventure business, the Adrenalina dot se, uh, where. I bring people up to um, uh, different mountains or bring them sailing, bring them to the Arctic, uh, do some trips to Russia where I'm um, a translator and a door opener. Uh, But uh, at the same time, I also do a few gigs within management and coaching. Uh, So I I would like to continue with that, Uh, do a lot of um, other projects, creative projects. Um, I'm... I have a couple of book projects where um, I'm coupling up with other people to, to write or to make a book. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm still hoping to spend a lot of time with uh, my family. And uh, this summer gives a good opportunity to, um, to learn the kids, uh, the uh, uh, art of sailing and the love of the sea. So mm-hmm. um, looking forward to that. And then the... Uh, uh, I cannot tell. I cannot say much more about that because if I will get uh, opportunities to um, to join some other projects or some other ex- expeditions, I will of course take them. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, I was uh, discussing uh, with the um, crews and the bosses of the um, the teams the uh, opportunities of uh, probably delivering the um, Volvo Ocean race boats back. Oh, wow. uh, after the race, yeah, <clears throat> and that gives me uh, a perfect possibility to learn the ropes on those boats. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've talked wow. to a lot of crews, um, asking them what does it take to to actually uh, join for such um, such races. And it's all about contact. It's all all about friends. It's all about people that they've already sailed with. Um, so. Uh, and I guess it's it's just like with everything, with um, all the rest of the sailing and mountaineering and business and so on. Uh, just exposing yourself to um, to a lot of possibilities and yeah. uh, getting a lot of contacts, and the sum of that uh, will give you even better opportunities for uh, developing yourself and your career in the future. So this is, I guess my plan continue doing what i love and uh hope to uh, to build on that well and, that, and that's fantastic i mean you you're you're certainly an amazing person for you to fly from sweden to australia and arrive on christmas eve and then you know step on board with us and do the sydney hobart and that was that was a, that was a great experience it was great it was great to see how somebody like you can just slot straight into a group uh and contribute in, in lots of ways and i guess if you take that ethos through your life, um, and you keep knocking on doors and you keep asking questions. Um, you know, opportunities come, I guess. And and you know, I'll I'll link off the Ocean Sailing Podcast website of the podcast episode within the site. I'll link to your website as well because I, I really oh, encourage you. everybody listening to this to go into that and look at all the photos from all your adventures because um, they're just amazing and they're very inspirational as well. And I was looking at that your site a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it just it inspired me. Um, and for for a lot of people, they think you know this stuff sounds great and it's you know scary and it's a big step, but it's just really a lot of baby steps, really. So you take one step, then you take another step, and you just push yourself a bit further and a bit higher and a bit harder, and you know one thing leads to another, yeah. and then and then once you've done that, then it's almost like it just lifts your whole horizon to another level, and then you think, okay, well I've done that. Well, what else is possible? But you know when I when I first sailed across the Tasman with a crew of four people. In 2013, I was quite terrified at the idea in the months leading up to it. And, and like you say, it was because I had confidence in my boat because I'd spent a lot of money refitting it. And I had a confidence in this, mm-hmm. a skipper that I hired who had done 39,000 you know, blue water miles. And he was a good guy. And so well, all of us had confidence in him. And when we had a couple of tricky situations um, with weather and, and you know mechanical issues, his, his leadership and confidence and his experience got us... Not not got us through, but we just we just never had any doubts because he was a capable person. Um, and um, and then I think you know this this year I've I've just uh, in March I sailed you know from Tasmania to New Zealand and then 
and then in April from New Zealand back to Maluda Bay on the solo Tasman race. And for me, that was a, another big step. And absolutely, I was, I, I had you know some fears in the back of my mind, but nowhere near the fear that I had doing it with four other, you know, three other people um, five years ago. Um, you know, once you once you've done it already, even though doing it on doing a solo is another step again. I just loved it. I enjoyed it. Um, and but also, I did have. I had faith in the boat because of the preparation. I had faith in my experience. I had faith that I was going to, you know, take a lot of take a lot of steps that were, you know, extremely safe in terms of how I was going to conduct myself. I had faith in the weather. The person giving me weather forecasting and kind of if you remove all the, you know, most of the unknowns at least, and you've got faith in the experience of the people around you and and and, and the conditions and, and in your boat, then you can actually just enjoy it. Um, even even though to others it might appear a, cra- a crazy scary thing to do, you can actually. You can really love the experience, and so I. But it's also, I think, it's addictive. Um, the more you do that, the more that you start thinking about what else is possible. Absolutely, and this this is what I call the um, uh, the, the uh, damnation of all alpinists. Uh, when usual people climb a mountain, they have climbed the mountain and they celebrate it. But you do not become an alpinist if you don't have this personality trait when you climb a mountain and the only thing you see around you is higher mountains <laughs> that you also want to climb yeah because you you cannot see the higher mountains from down below i can first see them when you're on the top mm. and no matter how um how hard the climb was the when you're going down you're already planning the next big thing that is even tougher and even uh, even more challenging. And I guess this is the same for sailors. Um, uh, after well, before doing the Sydney to Harbour race, as I told you, I was um, I was very excited, and I thought that okay, this this will be the um, um, the top of my career as a sa- as a sailor. And uh, after having done it, uh, when we were there on the prize giving ceremony. I was just realizing that, hey, this is my first Sydney to Hobart. Mm. Those guys are getting medals for their 25th or 30th. Now, that's a way to go. That's a way to go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this was only my first one. Yeah. It's, now, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to do 25 or 30 Sydney to Hobart, but uh, I will be happy to do it again uh, at least a couple of times. And also do a little bit of more of uh, racing, sailing, which um, Sydney to Hobart was just an eye opener. It, it was amazing. Mm. And we had we had quite nice weather too compared to how it can be. So it was a bit of a it was a bit of a nice baptism, wasn't it? It wasn't it wasn't you know. Yeah. I'm sure you've had much yeah, better conditions than what you've done previously in the Arctic. Uh, yes, that's correct. I was. Uh, I remember when uh, the rest of the crew were uh, dressing, uh, putting on all their um, warm gear, and uh, commenting on how cold it was. And mm. I was just like, oh, "Well, this is this is a good summer summer's day in Sweden. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is perfect for sailing." Um, so, yeah. I wouldn't. I don't want to complain about the uh, the conditions of uh, uh, the last Sydney to Hobart, which were actually perfect for mm. uh, for racing fast. But uh, I was I was expecting a little bit more of a challenge. I like challenges, mm. so I'll just have to uh, to go again well, and <laughs> I'm um, see. It- entering again next year so um you are most welcome to come back and rejoin us for round two um the the christmas after I'd this if you want to have another go because we, you can probably guarantee it won't be the the same golden weather um given it was the best weather in 73 years of the race and next next year's a 75th edition and they're, and they're expecting a bumper fleet of more than 150 yachts for that edition of the race from what i understand so that'd be pretty spectacular wow i'd love to uh, to go that'll be great so. That's great. Well, um, Lena, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. And um, thank you so much for um, putting aside your time on a Saturday morning for me. And um, it's pretty cool that you could be in Gothenburg in Sweden to see the the Volvo Ocean Race Village and the and the, the yachts that have just arrived. That's I've I've done that um, 
a couple of times now, and the last time I did that was a, a few years ago in Auckland, and it's just an absolute buzz to see the boats and the crews and the people and the technology, and it really is. So um, that's pretty cool that you can do that. So um, so what's your pick? Do you have a pick as to which of those three boats that are leading are going to take out the race? Do you have a, do you have a feeling for that? Uh, sorry, which one of them? Yeah, yeah, so Team oh, Brunel, Dongfeng, yeah. or Mapfrey, do you have any, any instincts or any, oh, any sort that's, of dockside chat around that? Uh, it, actually, impossible to tell because I've, I've talked to all of the teams there and all of them have great team spirit. You know how their, uh, the, um, their placements uh, have changed mm -hmm. quite dramatically mm. over time. And this is, this is a great sign of um, a good team spirit and sportsmanship, being mm. able to go from uh, from the back to the front or from the front to the back and uh, back into the lead again without losing your uh, competitiveness, without losing your team spirit. And I think all of the, the three boats that are in the lead still have it. So it could, could just be anyone. Yeah. And it's just a matter of staying focused having a laser focus and um, uh, not losing it until crossing the finish line. No, well, ex exactly right. And I, I doubt any of them will sleep in the final league of the race, given it's, less, it's probably going to be less than 48 hours. Um, so, um, yeah. be a flying finish. Um, well, that's fantastic, Lena. That's um, so good to catch up and uh, really, really good to talk to you. And thank you so much for uh, agreeing to appear on the podcast and do an interview. I really enjoyed this and, um, and I'm keen to stay in touch uh, and find out more about you know some of the adventures you have ahead of you and uh, I'll definitely link to your website for the podcast episode as well and send you the details for that and uh, I look forward to signing with you again in the future. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much, David. It was great chatting with you again and uh, hope to see you soon. Okay. If, yep. if not before the uh, Sydney to Harvard uh, in, what was it, uh, 2020? Yeah, right? so about, it's about yeah. 16, uh, about 18 months away now, so end of next year. Um, but ah. um, hopefully I can go up to the Arctic and do some sailing with you. I'd love to do that as well. Oh, that would be nice. That would be great. So, yeah. Okay. So let's stay in touch and thanks for today. Okay, thank you and have a, have a great weekend. Bye. Bye now. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to david at oceansailingpodcast.com.au. See you next week. Thanks for joining me this week on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. If you've got a great story idea or you know somebody who I can talk to, please uh, drop me an email with the details. If you'd like to join us on an upcoming ocean passage, ocean race or sailing regatta, we've got a handful of spots available in 2018 on the calendar we've just released. So go to the website, check out the calendar at oceansailingpodcast.com and we've got the Brisbane to Keppel race, followed by Hamilton Island Race Week, followed by a 600 nautical mile ocean delivery trip from Hamilton Island to Southport in August and September of this year. There's lots of photos, lots of videos you can check out to give you a bit of a taste of what it's about. But if you've always wanted to get offshore or go ocean sailing or join a, uh, a race team just for a, uh, a, a one-off ocean race or regatta, this is a unique opportunity to join a, an experienced and professional team with a handful of spots we have available. I'm working on an exciting calendar for 2019 and I'll have that available in a couple of months. I'll see you on the next episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast.
watching some getting ready to die.